This is the Rugby Odds, where an unlikely pundit panel of a wordsmith, a WWE legend, a rugby star, and a supermodel scour the globe, seeking best bets and bad behavior. Are you not entertained? I love it. Thank you. Thank you. Great. You are absolutely great. But look, you can see in the sponsor opportunity green room, WWE Hall of Famer John Bradshaw Layfield and King Gifte Beilu, inventor of words, prepping diligently because it's another great show. It's Rugby World Cup top heavy. We have Mr. George Hook coming in. But without any further ado, let's bring in John and Gift. Gentlemen, we had another great week, 40 and 17. We don't have a lot of time because we have Mr. Hook waiting in the Sponsor Opportunity Green Room, and we have a lot to get to around the Rugby World Cup, obviously. But I don't want to give short shrift to the picks that we made. We were pretty good, guys. 40 and 17, 6 and 2, each in the World Cup. Plus, we had the NPC and the NRL. But let's get right to the business of the Wooden Spoon and the Walk of Shame. I had a slightly better record by one game than both of you who had tremendous weeks. And again, I know that you don't. You don't uh, spike the ball. You don't high five. You just you just walk back to the huddle. But we do have the wooden spoon and the walk of shame to assign. And it's tough when we're so good at what we're doing to pick that. But John, you make it easy for various reasons. What various reasons? For having to have your microphone turned off during this show so many times. I get the wooden for that. How about you get the wooden bat for that? Because I don't know if you know what this says right here, Texas. Texas, America's team just rolled up. Again, he just had his mic muted for the very reason why he got the wooden spoon this week. Unfortunately, John, now we have to segue real quickly to the walk of shame because we have Mr. Hook waiting, bringing you back in. How about them longhorns rolling into Alabama and whooping them boys down there? All right, he's not ready to come back and talk rugby, so we're going to mute his mic. And he's also getting the walk of shame because he was texting about Latvia versus Wales in soccer while we're trying to do this show, ladies and gentlemen. Inexcusable. Have you ever been to Latvia? It's a hell of a country. It is a right. great country. Smoking mm. hot. Smoking hot. Hey, and don't forget, you can use this wooden spoon as a bat to bang a trash can. You know why? Because the Houston Astros. Giff, thank you for your patience and understanding while your colleague loses his mind. We're going to take a quick break and come back with Mr. George Hook after this. Need a great price on a new vehicle? Sheehy makes it easy. Easy Price shows you our lowest prices on the Mid-Atlantic's largest selection. Find your best price online or at any of our 31 dealerships. It's easy at Sheehy. If you're in New York City and want to watch some great rugby, have some great food, and some great times, go to the world's best rugby pub, The Pig & Whistle, on West 36th Street. Welcome to the show once again, Mr. George Hook! Yeah! Hello. Hey. Hi, hi. <laughs> hi, Matt. Hi, hi. How are you, Mr. Hook? Uh, not well. Uh, the reason I'm in my pajamas is I've been watching so much rugby over three-day weekend that I'm exhausted. I'm about to go to bed. You know I what a what a everything. terrible rough life that that is. I I, yeah. I don't know how you get through the day. Yeah, this is going on. Remember until the 28th of October. So I mean, we're going to have a lot of chats with me rubbing the sleep out of my eyes so that segues perfectly george what we learned about right after round one of the rugby world cup we learned that you're going to be watching in pajamas but what else did we learn and why don't you kick it off one this is the last world cup we will ever see like this the next world cup will be utterly different before a ball was kicked this was a shambles right we, we had a draw made three years ago. Shambles. The French buses, trains, and automobiles don't work so nobody can get to the ground. The gates don't open so they can't get in time for the match. <laughs> it's 100 degrees in the shade, so there's no water on sale. So that's how we start, right? Now what happens next? The refereeing is rubbish, 
okay? With the much vaunted system, it was going to be an expert in the bunker and the referees were going to just give him the problem. Failure. We have seen disastrous decisions about cards, either the issuing of cards or the non-issuing of cards. We have seen very poor refereeing into the bargain, even allowing for that. Will South Africa, the question, will they be the first team in history to win the World Cup without a place kicker? It couldn't kick the ball over the bar from in front of the post pretty well, right? Um, so this has, in my view, this has not been a good start. I'm pretty happy that finally the New Zealand belief that they're the greatest team in the world has been nailed. And we now see they are without a single attacking option. And their attack coach, who formerly made a mess of Ireland, is now making a mess of his native country, New Zealand. So, <laughs> right? I, I'm disappointed, obviously, that there have to be minnows. So you got to see Romania beaten by 82 points by Ireland. It's meaningless. Only maybe a beaten by Italy or Georgia beaten by Australia. But how in the name of all that is good and holy did Argentina come on the pitch like they did? Oh. Argentina were my long shot to make the final out of a week or half. I couldn't believe it. And Michael Czech is not the worst coach. Before you start asking me that. Hey, is, is, is Czech the worst coach? Oh, no. I have no idea. For the first time in my 82 years, I am prepared to admit I haven't got a clue. <laughs> I have no idea what Argentina were playing. At. But my <laughs> other long shot, Fiji were cruelly treated oh. by a rubbish British referee. But this is the British. I mean, this is what they did to you over 200 years ago. This is what they did to us over 800 years ago. I mean, they just make a habit of, of making a hard time yeah. for innocent nations. And Carly <laughs> was a pain in my butt. That's what I learned. That's a lot that we learned there. I and mean, I, I just want to tap in and see if any of my colleagues here also learned anything. John, you want to take a stab at this? No, I don't want to follow that. No, <laughs> no, I don't. No, it's impossible. Yeah. I know better. I want you to regroup here. There's got to be something that you took out of this. It's like following the rock. You just don't do it. You don't try. You just don't do it. It's simple. I'll tell you what I learned. It's not going to be near that entertaining. So I, if you're watching this show, just fast forward past me because I promise you, it, you'll, be, you'll be better off for doing it. I learned two things in this New Zealand-France game. I learned, number one, New Zealand is a top three, is not a top three team in the world like people thought they were. You got uh, France, South Africa, and uh, Ireland, top three teams. New Zealand is not in that league. And number two, France is better than they think they are. That first half was one of the worst halves of rugby I've ever seen because they were scared of New Zealand. So they're just kicking the ball. They think we're just going to play position, play position, hope they make a mistake. France came out the second half and they pressed the game. And once they started taking the field vertical, they realized they were better than New Zealand. I mean, they rolled them in the second half. But that first half, they're sitting out there. That was a terrible Terrible half of rugby, and it's because France did not believe in themselves. I mean, they're missing their big prop. They're missing their fly half. I think they thought they had to kick to win the game. They realized they were better. That changes things because France is a really good side. That last 20 minutes, the way the French played, that could be the key pivotal moments oh. in this Rugby World Cup because that's when you well, – you're right. They gained that confidence. They were a better side than New Zealand, and when they started realizing that, they got the, they got on the front foot, and, and New Zealand never got off their back foot. And France just pressure, pressure, pressure. They destroyed them in, in the last half of that second half. And they, it's all because France finally realized they were the better side. Gift. I mean, once again, how do you follow up then to follow up with that whenever it's just taken from there? So for me, obviously, I think I concur fully with uh, the, the the context of France and New Zealand. So I don't, I'm not going to go back into that again. I'm going to say with uh, – England and Argentina. Uh, one, Argentina was also my long shot uh, finalist 
And uh, they very much they disappointed too, Quentin Eric. Absolute, <laughs> absolute lack of strategy. But I'm going to give them this. George Ford for England was yeah. Steph Curry. Like, there's sometimes whenever you can bring a great baton and just beat people through. And that's what Argentina did. But England came with sharpshooters. They scored nothing in terms of tries. They just sharpshooted. If you can drop kicking from 80 meters back, you can't do anything against that. I don't think England can repeat that on a regular basis. And I think teams will be able to uh, compensate for allowing that to consistently happen four times in a row, unlike Argentina, who did not adjust to that at all throughout the game. So I'll take that. Fiji-Wales really was the best game that wasn't seen, but I do wonder if Fiji is a story or a contender. Because even though they lost off of that last little bit, that one was, it was a close game. It was a lot of talent, but I do wonder if they had the same issue that France had. And I feel like I learned that Fiji is still a little bit scared and a little bit nervous, but they're willing to fight. But I want them to get that Olympic battle uh, confidence, not their, uh, we're just another island that is trying to show out. Still my dark horse to come out of the the the, the pool, but I, I, I'm a little scared. And then South Africa versus uh, Scotland. South Africa is reckless abandoned. All right. They do not care about their bodies and they got speed galore in the bat. And if yeah. you allow them to just get a sliver, they are going to absolutely do what we thought New Zealand was actually going to do and actually slice you through. But man, shout out to Scotland. But Sia Khaleesi is on some other level because that man was moving like a madman. They are coming to hunt. Three great uh, answers, fellas. I'm stunned. One thing that I learned is that it's easy to spot the international players that play for Japan because the five to six guys that are at every single breakdown are not traditionally Japanese. And I was watching the game in the world's best rugby pub, the Pig and Whistle on West 36th Street, jam-packed, and people were like, you know, making fun of Japan. I'm like, it's just more obvious with Japan. Look at the Irish back line. There's three guys from New Zealand in it. But, George, I'm going to come Wait back. Wait a minute. That's you. all your drunk weekend came up with? That's <laughs> possibly the dumbest analysis I've ever heard. That was an analysis. It was, it was an observation about two things that are blatantly obvious that anyone else can probably identify with. And also, the mint jerseys for South Africa, as my oh, wife my my wife phrase, what the fizzle is going on there? But I want to go back to George. I'm going to yield some of my time, George. Is Steve Borthwick, is he a genius? Did he just play us? And now this team is a contender? All right. Uh, can I quote from my greatest hero, Winston Churchill, all right? We will fight them on the beaches. We will never give in, all right? Now, they, deep down in this psyche, in this English psyche, and I knew this was going to happen, when the chips are down, the team takes over. Forget the coach. Coach isn't on the pitch. And and the big decision, and this is a monster decision for Bortrek, I would not pick Farrell for the remaining games. He's not eligible for the next one. But, I mean, when he becomes eligible, Ford is immeasurably better. The, the, whatever you might think about drop goals. And remember, the drop goals were once worth four points when the try yeah. was worth three, okay? Yeah. So the drop goal is still a key part of this game we love. For Ford to take the, the, the game in his hands and take those three shots, two in particular, demonstrates he's the man at number 10, not Farrell. Don't talk about Farrell at number 12. Uh, Tulagi had a super game at 12. The, the, the wild card for the English is do we play Marcus Smith at full back yeah. to give us another attacking option? But like, England are back. And now the, the English newspapers, you know, uh, which go back to Oliver Cromwell. I mean, they think they're going to win this thing. They're not going to win it, but they're going to do better than a lot of people thought. George, what about Owen Farrell? I think what they should do is use the Ryder Cup system. Farrell becomes the non-playing captain. <laughs> We're going to take a quick break. 
and we're going to come back and we're going to ask questions of Mr. Hook and milk his wisdom right after this. You need your cleats? You need them tomorrow? If you order today by 3 p.m. New York time or noon L.A. time, they can have them to you tomorrow. Young, old, male, female, if you're playing on turf, if you're playing on grass, if you're playing in the rain, you're playing in the heat, they've got you covered. RugbyNow.com. Go there now. And we are back, and once again, we have the privilege of Mr. George Hook joining us. And, George, we're going to try to pick your brain. John didn't like the milk your wisdom thing that I said (laughs) earlier. He gave me a lot of grief in the break. So we're going to use some of that wisdom to find out what we can do betting on this Rugby World Cup. Gift? All right, Mr. Hook, I got to ask, because we always talk about South Africa, and I'll keep referencing back to they haven't changed their play. This game, it felt like they were taking things more outside from their forwards and letting their backs and their scrum halves actually do what they're supposed to. Do you feel like maybe South Africa has evolved their play just a little bit, or do you think this was maybe a, just a moment? No, I don't. I mean, the thing is, if you want to beat New- South Africa, you know you have to take the ball wide and go around them. The problem is you mightn't have the ball. I mean, these 15 bruisers, and remember, they're going to have 15 forwards in the squad at two packs. These two packs are just going to kick them in your area so you can't take it wide. If you've got the kind of, particularly, the kind of wings they have, why wouldn't you put it wide? The weakness in this side is at number 10. Sure, he had a super cross kick to set up a great try, but he missed kicks that you know, I get today at 82 years of age. It is still very hard to win at rugby consistently without a goal kicker. To go to fast to clerk, he has many qualities. Yeah. But, but high grade goal kicking is not one of them. And that will cost them, by the way, guys. The French organizers succeeded. In butchering the Marseillaise. Yeah, <laughs> oh, oh, awful. How can you do that? After after Robespierre and Napoleon and oh. all these guys, how can you, they butcher the national anthems? But back to different South Africans. I'm not sure what the libel laws are like in uh, America, right? But Razzie Erasmus, I wouldn't trust him with two pair in a game of poker, <laughs> all right? They now have a new system. Have you heard about the South African traffic light system? Razzie is up there with a set of traffic lights, and he goes, orange will take a kick, green will kick to touch. Yeah. I mean, it's outrageous. And he also likes just wearing a v-neck t-shirt in the booth which is just ridiculous i know cat you're casual compared to the last couple of guys that coach and directors of rugby but he looks like a slob well i can't really talk about being dressed like a slob seeing you're not the director of rugby for the national rugby team of south africa all right you're in your living room well done gift great question are you like me where when you're watching johnny sexton every single time he blinks or twitches you're like oh my god is he hurt oh my god I'm slightly different on that. I think we have two guys who are actually more important than Johnny Sexton if we lose them. One is Fish, and that's the number seven, Josh Van der Fleer. The game hasn't changed in 200 years. If you don't have an open side flanker, you can't play this game. And if we don't have Flair, we can't play it. And the other one is we don't know his fitness, and that's Sheehan, the hooker. Yeah. And we saw without him how awful we are at the line out and other places. We need Sheehan and Van der Flair and then Sexton. Sexton will be okay. I used to play with his grandfather, golf with his grandfather. He's indestructible. The grandfather or Johnny? Well, both of them. They're both a pain in the ass. <laughs> John, did you have a question? Yeah, I did have a question, but I have an observation first. You got Mr. Hook bringing up Napoleon and Marseille, and you're bringing up V-neck T-shirts. 
It's, it's all related. To Michelangelo about crayons. Would you please? I'm just reading off the <laughs> teleprompter. We don't have a teleprompter. That's what's wrong with this show. <laughs> but we got Mr. Hook. So I want to ask Mr. Hook a question about um, Eddie Jones and Steve Borthwick. Steve Borthwick, England looked terrible in the Six Nations. They looked awesome this past week. Now, George Ford, those three drop goals in the first half certainly helped a lot. Eddie Jones, is he going to make that same turnaround with Australia? Because it looks like England versus Australia is going to be the matchup to see who goes to the final out of pool C and D, which is going to be a huge matchup in the rugby world because of all the politics and storylines involved with the drama. Bartwick has a, a CV where he he is a pretty straight up, if simple-minded kind of coach, all right? <laughs> He's very uh, simple-minded. All told people yeah. are. Eddie Jones, I just don't buy. Eddie Jones' favorite person is Eddie Jones. So he's, going in, he's going into this World Cup, not hoping Australia are going to do really well, but that Eddie Jones is going to do really well. Rugby in Australia is essentially about two states, New South Wales uh, and, and uh, Queensland. So it's very much a minority sport. And they've done extraordinarily well over the years with limited facilities and ability. I don't think they can crack that. Uh, but, but George, Eddie Jones is a god, especially according to the two colleagues that I have on this panel. He's the catch We never out. said he was a god. We said England has not won since Eddie Jones left, which is true. They, exactly. they formed a website. They're following him, George, these two. <laughs> he didn't win when Eddie Jones was there. I mean, come on. Exactly. Look, Look at the figures. Like Eddie Jones had has done well. I don't deny that, but Eddie Jones's race is run. You know. Yes. Uh, you know when you talk about coaches, sometimes we exaggerate their importance. Eddie Jones is not going to make Australia any good. Thank you. Thank you very <laughs> much. Thank you, thank you, thank wait, you. Wait, wait, wait. Is, is Ed, do you think Eddie Jones is not a good coach? Because he did a pretty good job in Japan, and he did win with England. Maybe it was because he inherited a great team. Do you think that Eddie Jones, uh, flat out, is not a good coach? England. I think Eddie Jones resembles uh, my former friend, former U.S. Eagles coach and former Ireland coach, and now the coach to Brown University in Rhode Island, Eddie O'Sullivan. Eddie O'Sullivan and Eddie Jones are outstanding technical coaches. They're not very good at man management. Right, we got Eddie, Eddie O'Sullivan's on the phone right now. He wants to call in to take you down, George. <laughs> All right. Well, the only team that didn't cover the spread this weekend was Australia and Eddie Jones's Wallabies, John and Gift. So on that note, we have to take a quick break. We're going to thank Mr. Hook for joining us. Thank you, George. Thank you, sir. Thank yeah. you, good. All right. Don't go away. We'll be right back after this. From New York City comes America's longest-running and most popular rugby show. The biggest names in Major League Rugby, MLR highlights, and big match previews. Rugby Wrap-Up presents MLR Weekly, made in New York City. We are back. How great was Mr. Hook being on here, fellas? Just, uh, just, a, just a real treat to have him on. Did you learn anything? He's bringing up philosophy. He's bringing up Shakespeare. He's bringing up Napoleon. You're bringing up V-neck shirts. What the hell is wrong with you? That was the dumbest comment I've ever heard in my life. It was gutsy to call Rassi Erasmus out on his choice of not even 100% white T-shirt because it's kind of like sooty looking. All right. So that's something that I okay, have to do that was as a hard-hitting journalist. That was the dumbest comment. That right there now superseded it. <laughs> <laughs> you learned nothing about my power on this show. I will mute you in a second. Can you get me off the show permanently? How about that? Oh, no. This is your purgatory. This is your purgatory. <laughs> so we have to get to the business of picking the NPC and the NRL. Let's start with the NPC. John, who do you like? Wellington. Well, look, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. Very simple. Been betting Wellington. Keep betting Wellington. Continue betting Wellington. We're going to win all kinds of money with Wellington. That's right there. That's right there. So you're going back to the 
well, Ington. Gift? Who do you that like? That was the dumbest comment, per- <laughs> superseded by a dumber comment, superseded by another dumb comment. You were on here with a royalty with the king. Just shut up and let him talk. We're looking at Taranaki Otago, looking at Taranaki to take this one. Otago, hey, better luck next week. I'm going to go ahead with my pick while John's been muted once again for the 15th time in the show. I'm going with Canterbury to bounce back. Now let's go to the NRL. John. I am not going to bet on your roosters. Because I know you like roosters. So I'm betting on the storm to take the roosters. All right, he likes the storm over the roosters. Gift, who do you like? When you got something like a knight versus a warrior, you know, we know what's happened in history. Warriors always rise up, but they end up getting killed down by the knights. And this is why England existed as day, Anglo-Saxon life. So knights are going to continue to be able to do what they need to do and be able to keep winning, you know? It's a demolishment game. <laughs> All right. I'm, I'm going to counter that. I'm going with the Cox. I'm taking the Roosters. I'm right. taking the Roosters. <laughs> On that note, fellas, we are basically out of time. We have our picks of the week. John. There's a future bet to make the finals. you got two different bets that are out there right now. England is plus 325 to make the finals. Uh, Australia is plus 400. Bet them both. Because one of those two teams, I believe, makes the finals out of that division. Neither one of those two teams can beat the top three in the other two pools. But I think one of those two teams win it, so you better both come away with winning profits. Ooh, gift? Australia-Fiji game. I think this is the one that actually changes the entire pool itself. The loss against uh, Wales was iffy. Fiji has a chance to be able to show out because, honestly, most of Australia's players seem to have come from Fiji anyways. So I look at Fiji to actually take this one and at least beat the spread. I love Eddie Jones, but I like Fiji to be able to win and kind of take back what belongs to them. First Olympic and World Cup champions. That's what we're looking for. I like that pick, Gift. I like that pick. I'm sticking with the rub of the green. I like the Irish to dominate Tonga and cover that big spread. On that note, we're out of time, fellas. Plugs, John. Stories with Briscoe and Bradshaw is a show I do with the Hall of Famer from Oklahoma, Mr. Gerald Briscoe. We interview all kinds of sporting legends, MMA legends, and wrestling legends, all kinds of great and fun stories. Stories with Briscoe and Bradshaw. Gift. Hey, Rugby Swag Show is back. We're back for a new season, now following more HBCUs, definitely World Cup, and also new interviews coming through. So definitely check it out. Rugby Swag Show with Gift of Go. All right, I'm going to pick the world's best rugby pub once again, the Pig & Whistle. Look at this video from the matches this weekend. Insane atmosphere, and the air conditioning actually worked when it was boiling hot here in Manhattan. The heat's breaking. The the bar is awesome. The beer is cold. Go see Cormac McCormack and tell him John Bradshaw Layfield sent you. You dang right. Give him my best because he's a good dude. It's the best pub in the entire freaking world. Matt's going to be there drunk again this weekend. (laughs) <laughs> On that note, we are out of time. Thank you to Mr. John, Bradshaw, Layfield, the WWE Hall of Thank you to King Gifte Bailu, the inventor of works. Thank you to the great Mr. George Hook. And thank you for tuning in. Please check out our other shows, including the MLR Weekly College Rugby Wrap-Up. Hit that subscribe button on YouTube. Join our weekly newsletter. And please sign up for our American Red Cross blood donor team. <laughs>